Hello everybody, it's Current Cartoon TV coming to you back again. And we have a little special guest today going over our new review of She-Ra. Let me introduce you guys to Vash. Hello, I am Vash. Vash here is actually our lead uh, artist here at uh, CCTV. And uh, he has drawn up all our characters here. So this is actually a special uh, occasion to meet you actually for the first time in a long time. Uh, oh yeah, uh, I was about to say, I think the audience, if we have an audience of like a whole 12 people, people have noticed my maybe before i have actually the guy that did the one year anniversary video on your channel it's up to 37 people now but yeah oh we're up to 37 yeah gotta break even one day it's a special occasion to actually do a review of the new netflix reboot of the filmation's she-ra and the power of princesses yeah and it's also the same studio that did uh voltron oh yes so, dreamwork i'm excited yes and we know how all uh, Voltron is doing right now. Ah, oh, man, sad it's over already. Yeah, but uh, wait for that review. Maybe we'll do a little review on that. If you don't do the review, I'm going to do it. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, anyways, let's go ahead and get into this review. Where should we start? There is a lot to take in on this Netflix series. Oh, yeah, there is a lot to take. Let's go ahead and start with our likes. Uh, Vash, what are your likes of this She-Ra and the power of princesses? Uh... I'm not sure about the subtitle to that name. Shira is fine with me, but I don't know. It's like, oh, the power of princesses. I'm okay with it. There's nothing wrong with it. I just don't go, yeah, okay. It feels like it's long. That being said, I think the series overall is well written. I think that's the best part for me is that the characters all feel organic. The animation uh, style is very bright and colorful. I like the art style. I think it's good. I can't think of too many negatives right at the top of my head. Overall, if you have time and you've liked uh, what DreamWorks has made so far with like Voltron, I think this is definitely in a lot of people's wheelhouse. And just because it's Shira first and no He-Man or whatever, I'm perfectly fine with that. I mean, the way the characters are all flushed out, I really don't see any genders really. I just see characters interacting with each other. I really like this reboot. I really like how they kept some of the original story into it, but they did little changes here and there. like. Aurora and Katra actually seem more sisters to each other instead of actual uh, co-worker soldiers. That in the original, they were just same level of rank as a uh, force captains. And the uh, in the original, though, the series takes place in Eternia, which definitely is in this one. But this time, this was actually colonized by what they're called the First Ones. And Shira, the princess, is actually a uh, substance of the first ones having a warrior princess to protect them. Yeah, that's what they kind of implied, didn't it? That it's like a lineage yes. of uh, people. Another thing I do like about this, they took some parts of other shows to make this one. Like, I do like the fact that Shira is actually a reincarnation of somebody that has the power mm -hmm. of uh, Grayskull, which kind of follows the same suit of the avatars from The Last Airbender, where it keeps on... I definitely got that feeling when they mentioned the chain stuff of uh, Shira's before her, mm -hmm. and they showed the whole art style. I was just like, oh my god, this is just, uh, this is like Legend of Korra scene with her looking at all the avatars and stuff, and I just, before her, and I was just like, holy crud. It's definitely got that vibe. Yes, so you get that vibe out, and that's, that really deepens the story a little bit more. It, it's changed from the original, but it's good and all this. Another part I like about each episode was the transfer Transformation scene of Aurora to She-Ra. For the honor of Grayskull. It was like a Sailor Moon transform from the, the Japanese anime, but instead of being a delicate, like a ballet dancer, it was a more of a powerful transformation. Like every time she actually like threw her sword up and then actually did a bringing fist pound in her hand to create the, the bracelets on her arms, it just like meant like she was ready for battle. Yeah, I definitely got that more. It felt like a transformation from like Sailor Moon, but more of like, let's do this kind of attitude to it. I, I also loved it, the fact that her character actually gained height. Mm -hmm. Yes. And even one of the characters made that as a joke saying, uh, okay, 
I'm in. Really? Yeah. The Horde almost destroyed my home. I want to help fight them. Plus, your friend over there can turn into a, like, eight-foot-tall lady with a sword, and I want her on my side. I like you guys, but I like your friend better because she transforms into a nine-foot-tall Amazon woman. Yes. I just snickered when that scene popped up. Oh, yes. Uh, it's, sadly, though, it, it kept on getting shorter and shorter as the show kept on going. It became, like, a long, like, 15 to 20 seconds down to 15 seconds to actually 10 seconds to the point where she just transforms on the run. It's like, oh, hold on. <laughs> Change. All right. Yeah, for me, though, I'm... I kind of liked that they got shorter because I feel like when TV shows, especially when I was a kid, they would show the same transformation every time, the same length unchanged every, it, it kind of got, it would lose its pizzazz. It's like, okay, we'll just transform more where you get into the action. Oh no, we're doing this every episode. Um, it, it felt less special then. And I could see it being nice to keep it long but at the same time i do appreciate they had shorter because by then it was like hey we clearly know she's she's got the power she's got the power so the animation of the series is okay with me it's not as bad but it does follow that cal art star that we're all getting used to like from shows from gravity falls steven universe star versus the forces of evil and even gumball a variation of it yeah it's not bad. The colors look amazing. The backgrounds are so detailed. I, like that whispering forest. Oh my god. Yeah, that is the thing about that that I will agree with you. It's like the backgrounds are almost on certain situations, especially like in the first episode where the fright zone was so detailed and the characters are almost simple in comparison. So, I don't know. Yeah, it kind of helps them pop out from the background, but I don't know. It's like when your background is that busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I understand what you're saying on that one. I'm hoping in the next season two, they put a little bit more detail into the character art and all that, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Okay, there is one little detail with the character art that it, at first I thought was interesting choice-wise, but as time went along, on, especially on certain characters with certain skin tones, they have this little splotch that goes over the ridge of their nose and onto each cheek. Oh, if yes. you happen to have a still frame to show a picture, uh, I, I thought, oh, that's an interesting way of doing it. It's kind of like a highlight on their face, but then it never moves. So when their character's face changes angles or whatever, if it was like it was like that highlight would never change, okay. despite their character smiling or not smiling. And I'm like, mm, mm, I guess it works, but I don't know. Art choices. I I've worked in art for 20 plus years. And I still don't fully understand it, you know, viewer's choice. I did like how they changed the approach of Aurora defecting the Horde and joining the Resistance. In the original film, He-Man just brought Aurora to the Resistance like, hey, she's my sister now. She's now good. I do like how in this Netflix series that Glimmer and Bo, especially Glimmer, was actually being very cautious of Aurora when she actually kind of changed. Like she was confused at how the horde is doing this and all that but by the end of episode two you actually see her actually pledging her allegiance to uh glimmer's mom and uh, joining the resistance against yeah. the uh, horde which i thought that was a great yeah i, I thought that was a great idea too it also kind of helped that it seemed like her mom knew who she was when she transformed she went oh god it's shira mm -hmm. it's like oh nice so it helps speed things along in my eyes. The only thing I have against that, kinda, is that, yes, Bright Moon actually did a Separoya slash she allegiance to the Resistance, but what about the other nations? Did they, why did they accept her so easily? Because she, because Bright Moon did it? So they, should they do it? But that's just a little nitpick there for me. I, I think it's because of the legend that surrounds the, the character. And they're like, well, we've been stagnant for all these years. Maybe it's worth a shot. That's why I kind of felt like some of the princesses were doing. Okay. And, the, and they realized, nah, eh, she's not too bad. Yeah. So. Oh, she helped us fix our gate in like that one episode. Oh yeah, this, uh, the uh, with the the mermaid. Uh, I forgot her name. I I, I actually kind of like that. It dawned on me now when I think back on the episodes that um, not all episodes broke down to being just fighting. Oh, you, she she swoops in and uses her sword to save the day. No, it was just literally she used the sword to fix the gate and problem solved. And was just like, oh, really? No fighting. What do you mean? It's not like a Saturday a.m. 
uh, episode here where the hero saves the day. Yeah, it's not I'm, what I'm trying to say. It didn't do the cliche ba uh, bad guy of the week kind of thing. And yeah, it was they saw, came up with a creative solution for the problem that didn't have to de-evolve to what's, you know, transform and fight monster. <laughs> and I did like the overall lesson of, in the story. It's interesting to actually think about it. Mm. This a series is actually geared more towards female audience, but I'm a big fan of uh, He-Man, and I had to watch this. I'm kind of hoping they bring him into this this like world, too, one way or another. But I Well, strongly implied, he probably exists. They just, uh, they just haven't announced him yet. Right. What I took from this show was even if you're tasked with a big responsibility by yourself, you're the chosen one to protect the world, is that you can't do it by yourself. You need help from your friends and ally. And that's what I took from this, because you know, she is all powerful and all that, but this is probably why the uh, lineage broke thousands of years ago, because it was always held onto one person, and that one person, uh, Mira, couldn't take it anymore. And I do also like how the LGBT community is actually represented in this series in a great way, that even that the uh, Princess Prom and the uh, princesses at the end of the series were actually kind of like in you know, a good couples. Honestly, I see that stuff so often anymore. I'm just not phased anymore. Vash, what did you dislike about this uh, series? I think the series was well written, but uh, yeah, my one thing I would pick on about the series is when Entrapma was, she was talking to uh, Ketra and saying, oh, when we activate this device, it's going to harm the other princesses because they're linked to their stones. But I'm pretty much just gonna continue because I wanna see what happens. And I just go, wow, it's not like you're being tortured or forced to do this, or it's not like your friends intentionally abandoned you. You just kinda went, eh, I'm, I'm a scientist, uh, what the f I'm just gonna flip the switch and go and uh, see what happens. And it's just like, but you're gonna harm your friends and they're gonna take advantage of this. You know this if you're paying attention because you're, she pretty much implied it, the Ketra did. So I just went, what the f It just felt like out of the blue with that character doing that. So that would be my one pet peeve with the uh, show is that, and that's a small one. Thank God I have the sensor button. Anyways, what? I did not like about this series was the ages of the characters themselves. Aurora, Glamour, Bo, and Catra seem to be in their early teens, like 15 to 17, but I feel like these characters are much younger, like 13 to 14. I really didn't know what their ages were until actually the episode of Princess Prom, where they meet uh, Princess Frosta, and she states she's 11 and 3 quarters years old. It's like, holy cow, she's young. For me, when I looked at like the characters, especially the one that played Shira, I kind of seen her as mid to late teens from my perspective. I think the reason why I looked at it that way is because it was more because it's a North American animation, and we have a tendency to do mid to late teens more often in North America. But if it was a Japanese series, I could see being around early teens. Yeah, but you gotta admit though, like when Princess Frosta said, "Oh yeah, I'm 11 and three quarters years old." You're like, wow, hold on. <laughs> I will admit, I I, I, I I, swore she was younger than that. Because the way everyone reacted, I was like, what, she eight years old? <laughs> yeah. No, when she said her eight, I was just like, oh, okay. I don't look like it. <laughs> and another thing I disliked about the series was actually the horse swift win. I did not like him one bit. I'm sorry. It, yes, it was funny that everybody calling him horsey. I'll disagree with you. I thought it was f***ing hilarious when he came back and talked. Zone. I'll give you that. And I'll give you that. Yes, it was also funny that everybody was calling him horsey. But it was getting a little too much there. It's oh, like That's not his name. It was, yeah, it was like... I like it. He's like, no, that's not my name. <laughs> yeah. But he seemed like he was motivated to do other things than other than help She-Ra. Like, oh, I need to break down all these stable doors so our fellow brotherhood of horses could be free. Who asked them if they wanted to be well, free? Well, if I was a horse that was just minding my own business one day and some dang girl shot me with a magical beam sword and I sprouted wings and I started gaining sentience, 
I would probably go off and rescue my brethren because I had discovered vocabulary. It just makes that character seem that he's full of himself. Yeah, he kind of redeems himself at the end, but still, he that that horse is full oh, of himself. Oh, but for a horse, he, did, he was pretty arrogant. So, and then my last thing is I do not like about this is that, because I'm a fan of the original He-Man slash She-Ra. In, in the original, Havoc and... Uh, Shadow Weaver seemed much, pretty much on the same page of uh, conquering Etheria. In this new series, it seems like Shadow Weaver is always just pushed down by Havoc. It's like, hey, you're not listening to me. I told you to do this. You're not listening to me. And then I'm punishing you. I kind of got the sense that Shadow Weaver was a former princess. And he doesn't quite trust her. That's why I kind of got the impression. Yeah, I, I guess from a person that has never seen the original series. I know. For, I could see from your perspective and you kind of have your notes. But we've also said that this series is a little different. So they might have the same name, but maybe a different backstory. That's what I'm guessing at. Shadow Weaver was so easily discarded at the end of the season after Catra managed to defeat her. She's like, oh, okay, throw her in the prison. That's it? Done? No, like, plot the revenge? No, she's not down, man. She's coming back. She's one of those hardcore villains. She's like Disney villain of the week. She's 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 not down. It just it made Shadow Weaver seem like a mid-tier boss in, in this. Like, she's not even, like, the main boss. She's just, like, a mid-boss. I didn't get the feel that she was a mid-tier boss. I just felt like more her obsession with, um, she was just ridiculous to an extent. And I feel like that there's some underlining plot to it that the, she needs to keep her under her thumb. Maybe, like, I don't know, do something freaky like possess her body in the future so she can have her powers because her body's currently decaying. You know, some weird stuff. I That's what I would imagine is going on in the underlying tone that they're going to launch in, like, the second season. Uh, but, like I said, I've never seen the original series, so I have no expectations. So I'm this is my imagination. Anyway, so let's go ahead and get to our ratings here. So, Vash, I don't know you know the rules of this, but you have to rate this from 1 to 5. No half points, no quarter points, no point nines, no point eights, and all that. What do you give this series? For me, never seeing the original series and just watching it as, like, its own standalone thing for the first time, I, I feel like it's a good launch off point, and I could see it keep going uphill from here or being better. So I'll be generous. I give it a solid five out of five. Wow, five out of five. Your first review, and you're gonna give your first thing a five out of five. I give this actually a four out of five. It was a great season. I hope they learn from their mistakes and make season two much better. I, I'm really hoping they make that season two very good. I'm hoping for more detail in characters. I definitely agree with you. If they don't go with what they have and uh, keep improving from it, I will not be so generous on my score next season it, because I feel like this is a good start, but e if you don't keep it going, I, I will yeah be down to like three out of five if they don't. Any final thoughts of the, uh, the series you want to point out? I feel like they need to flush out why the bad guys have certain motivations. What's with them? Why does Shadow Reaver really want a Shira? Uh, what's up with, you know, the stones? Where did that come from? You know, little things like that. But I feel like that'll be explained later on as needed. And I absolutely love this show. I hope this brings more old licenses that need a reboot into the spotlight. DreamWorks has done an amazing great job with old licenses already. Like Voltron. Man, that series just like freaking blew up in everybody's face. No one saw that coming from DreamWorks. And they have done an amazing job with Voltron. And I hope Netflix mm -hmm. sees this as a sign of strength and green lights more old licenses like He-Man. I'm still hoping for a, a standalone He-Man. Captain Planet, G.I. Joe's, and even Johnny Quest. I would love to see a reboot of Johnny Quest. That would be amazing. Hey, you know what would be really interesting? Since He-Man was first, and he was created first, and then he, they introduced She-Ra through his show, it would be interesting with the reboot, they introduced He-Man through She-Ra. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Right now, uh, Warner Brothers actually owns the rights to that. So let's see what happens on that. Oh, really? Yep. See? It's amazing what you learn on the internet this day and age. Oh, yeah. So, 
Well, Vash, thank you for actually coming by to these new studios here and actually uh, doing a review of She-Ra with us. you have any like plugins you want to say out there? I do have a DeviantArt page with uh, my name, DarkVash64High, and I have a personal YouTube channel, and if you want to see my more of my latest artwork, pretty much stay tuned to this channel. Oh, yes, and uh, we'll have links below in the comment page here with his links and even our links to our Twitter page, our Facebook page, and even our Patreon page. Anyways, thank Thank you guys for listening to us yeah thanks for coming by i hope to see more of you guys in the future oh yes uh thank you and good night